Hello and welcome to At Issue. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. Since about 2013, commodity prices have been in a somewhat of a downward trend and that has been impacting farmers in a negative way, of course. So for the next half hour, we want to address the issues surrounding that downward trend. We're also going to be talking about how trade impacts that. We'll take a look at the 2018 Farm Bill as it evolves in Congress. And we'll talk about reorganization at the USDA all in the next half hour with three people who know a little bit about, in fact, a lot about it. Let me say welcome to the program to Mark Gebhardt. He is the Illinois Farm Bureau Governmental Affairs Executive Director. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Also with us is David Menold. David is a farmer with land in both Peoria and Stark County. He has 1,500 acres of corn and beans. He has some cattle. He has some hay. And he's a no-till farmer. Thank you for joining us. Good to be here. And Doug Yoder is here. Doug is the crop agency manager for Country Financial. Thank you for being with us, Doug. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And let's start with crop prices. Okay. Uh, we've been in a trough, so to speak, for about four years now. Is there, uh, can you attribute that to one, maybe two issues, or is it a very complex situation? It, it's multiple factors, so it is somewhat complex, but I, I guess in, in a kind of a nutshell summary, we had record high corn and bean prices right ahead of that time period that you mentioned back in the late 2009-10 era. era. Coming off of that, of course, record high prices does one thing. It encourages production, not only here in the U.S., but around the world. So we have seen production levels increase around the world. And, of course, agriculture is very cyclical. We're price takers. We can't set the price of the product we produce. So when you see production go up like that around the world, eventually that it turns around in a cyclical nature, and we're in the downward cycle of that right now. Where, as you've mentioned, we're seeing depressed corn and beans and wheat prices. Corn, for instance, is at what per bushel? Cash prices around Illinois, roughly 350. Again, it wasn't that long ago we were talking six, seven dollar corn. So it is a significant drop. It's not just a slight drop. You're you're talking some major drops in revenue uh, when you factor in that drop of prices. David, can you make money at 350 a bushel? No. Well, if you own the land and it's paid for, you could. And uh, uh, there's a reasonable margin there, but uh, most farmers, including myself, uh, rent land, and uh, uh, cash rents haven't dropped uh, enough, and, and that's that's the market speaking. You know, I, and Doug mentioned that uh, um, that that the uh, price had dropped precipitously for farmers, but it's also dropped for input suppliers too. And, and you see everywhere, people are uh, companies are struggling to try to make sense of this potash manufacturers are um, you know dealing with burdensome supplies and so they're having to cut their prices and, and there's you know mergers going on to try to achieve some efficiency so it's it's tough for everyone uh, that leads to a conversation about crop insurance mm -hmm. uh, there are several different types can you just in a thumbnail sketch tell us about crop insurance, how it works? Absolutely. I would say there's uh, three basic generations of crop insurance. From its inception, we farmers were able to buy yield protection. If their yields dropped, they could buy protection to help uh, generate a claim that way. Second generation started in 1998, revenue protection, where we now have price and yield gotcha. protection uh, combined. That's easily the number one choice of farmers in Illinois. Ninety plus percent of the policies we see purchased in this big state is revenue protection. This year, 2017, a third, a potential third generation was launched, margin protection, where we're now able to combine some input cost into that protection as well. That one's just being launched. We have a big learning curve ahead of us uh, to see if farmers and landowners like that sort of protection, but we have just launched that uh, here. In fact, I'm spending the winter going around the state trying to explain that new product to farmers and landowners to help that education, that learning curve take place. Is this type of insurance, like when we go out and buy insurance on our house or our automobile, or is the government more involved in this? Government's certainly more involved in there. I think there's a valid reason for that, but it's similar to, to other insurance. For example, every policy has a deductible. Now, one thing to keep in mind, it, while every insurance product is important, this is vital to keeping farmers in business. When we have a claim, it's not just repairing a fender bender on your car. It's it's designed to hopefully keep farmers in business. So it's a vital business uh, tool for them. But even saying that, they pay a lot of money for it. There's large deductibles. 
number one policy, most popular policy in Illinois is a farm level revenue protection product. Maximum coverage level they can buy is 85%. That means they have a 15% deductible at a minimum. Their revenue has to drop a minimum of 15% before the policy even kicks in. So yes, there's more government involvement that helps make it affordable and accessible, but there's still a large investment on the farmers, both in the premium and the deductible part of that. You wanted to add to that, Mark? Well, I think just from the standpoint, as we look at the 2018 Farm Bill, we, we write a new Farm Bill every five years. Uh, as we have gone out and talked with our members throughout the state at, uh, at Illinois Farm Bureau and out in the county Farm Bureau's crop insurance, uh, without a doubt, is the number one priority um, for the issues that Doug has mentioned in terms of being able to have that stability and have that risk management tool that's so important uh, for folks to be able to know that they, they can continue the operation in the event of a drought uh, or some other kind of a natural disaster that would occur. Um, and I think a point that, that we discussed a, a little bit earlier before we came on the air is really critically important as well. Um, this is really designed to make sure that we have a safe and affordable food supply. Um, and that's something that I know there's always a lot of debate about, you know, how much should the government subsidize this program. But at the end of the day, that should be the first concern for all Americans is to make sure we have that safe and affordable food supply and that we are not reliant on a foreign uh, country to supply our food like we are in the case sometimes of oil and other, other uh, energy issues. We want to address some of the issues involved in the 2018 Farm Bill as it goes through Congress. I believe the current Farm Bill expires next September, if I recall correctly. Yes, correct. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but I want to get back to crop insurance for just a moment with David. You carry crop insurance? Yes. Um, uh, has it served you well? It, uh, I would say it did what it was designed to do. Okay, uh, but I, I hearken back to 2012 and I remember uh, some things that were um, interesting anomalies in this structure that you just can't foresee this a lot of times and that's this is what causes me some fear in, in thinking about this margin uh, insurance situation but back to the um, the price insurance for example in 2012 we had really high grain prices and so that um, gave the insurance program an opportunity to insure those high prices and I remember talking to a couple of farmers, good farmers and excellent managers and they were, um, they had a continuous corn operation and, and they knew that they were going to harvest around 50 bushels per acre which is a serious loss. They had some really dry weather. They would have normally expected well over 200 bushels per acre and this gentleman told me that uh, well even though we're only going to harvest 50 bushels per acre we're going to make 1200 bucks an acre because of insurance and the insurance cost them about 50 bucks that year, 50 bucks per acre to insure $1,200 an acre, which I don't think you could ever do that with an actuarially sound program. In other words, an insurance company would not go out and write that. That would be like going out and writing a, uh, an insurance program for a young 16-year-old kid with a hot red Mustang and saying, we'll give you this for the same cost as the little old lady down here with the little falcon, you know. And, and I, I have to tell you that uh, as, we, as we try to um, create programs like this, what bothers me is that we are trying to keep farmers in business, which is good in a sense, but what we're doing is we're subsidizing something that's inefficient. The market's telling us right now not to plant corn, but if we produce a type of insurance that's going to encourage them to plant corn, then they'll do it. Anyway, just like right now, the government's got several programs, uh, and I just read in, the, in a magazine article that the corn program in the last three years, 2014 through 2016, got 13 bucks an acre, and soybeans got 24 cents an acre from these three government programs, the ACA and, and the PLC and, and so forth. And uh, these are outside of the insurance program. We've seen this a lot worse, where a government program comes in and it's designed to help farmers, but it creates another problem. It sounds like David's running contrary to what your basis was when you, you made your argument in favor of crop insurance. Well, I think David points out some of the challenges um, that are out here in terms of the, of the overall program, if you will. But again, I go back to, you know, this is a risk management tool um, that our folks have 
um, identified as something that's really critical in terms of being able to, again, manage that risk. Because for a farmer, um, not that every business person can manage a, a lot of the risk that enters into some of their lines of business, but for a farmer, they are so much subject to the weather. I mean, the, the weather is the dictator in terms of how much yield and, and how much productivity we might have uh, pursuant to a particular crop. So it's, it's just that tool. And what we hear from our membership, uh, again, loud and clear, is the importance of maintaining that in the 2018 Farm Bill and all the, the Farm Bills, as Doug alluded to earlier, that we've had these programs evolve. Um, each producer then, I think, has to sort of say, okay, how do I want to make use of that program in my operation? And we see that, that variability um, from farmer to farmer, uh, from crop farmer to livestock farmer. There's, there's certainly a variability there in how they utilize the program. But by and large, you know, there is a need for us to be able to have that tool in the toolbox, if you will. And it is a constant evolution, to David's point. Uh, you know, Congress reviews this annually, certainly reviews it during the long, drawn-out farm bill processes over time to answer that question, what is the right amount of support, what is the right amount of coverage to offer, and you're right, we don't want taxpayer-funded programs to allow us to over-insure. That is not the goal, and we see the evolution, we see changes to the program every year to make sure that we're managing that now in a correct fashion, because we do want to be responsible stewards of this program. It is taxpayer-funded. As you know, our farmers pay taxes like everyone else, so they want to make sure that we're using this money wisely. It is the number one support program in this very risk heavy industry so our members want to make sure that we can defend it in that public arena with regard to crop prices trade is also important uh, as a matter of fact just for the audience's benefit the u.s provides 50 percent of all corn exports in the world and 50 percent of all soybean exports so we're big exporters what's What's the position with regard to withdrawing from things like NAFTA or the Pacific Rim Agreement, et cetera? How is that going to impact the, the ability of the U.S. to, I mean, pr prices could drop even further. If Correct. Absolutely. It's, it's a huge issue. It's an issue, uh, I just was recently in Washington, D.C. again with our president, um, along with other State Farm Bureau leaders. Uh, the two issues that we worked on uh, while we were out there, of course, the tax reform bill uh, that's, that's in the mix, uh, if you will. But the other issue is trade, and in particular, uh, our opposition to a withdrawal from NAFTA. Um, just very quickly, what does this mean um, to, to folks, as you indicated, the, the significance of our exports? So if we were to, to not be in NAFTA, it would probably immediately, we would see about a 30 cent per bushel impact on corn, about 15 cents per bushel on soybeans, $70 give or take on, on uh, the cattle side per animal, uh, $30 give or take on the, uh, on the uh, pork side. Significant uh, in and of itself immediately, but then the longer term impact, once you are no longer a reliable trading partner uh, for these other uh, countries, um, the, just the time lag, if you will, to get those to get those agreements back. I know there's a lot of discussion by the administration about bilateral or unilateral agreements, um, and, and I understand that everyone wants fair trade, uh, as, our, as our president uh, talks about quite a bit, and we, we too want to make sure that these trade agreements are fair, but there has to be a process by, where, by which you mitigate the immediate impact that this would have on producers uh, like David and our other members around the state if you were just to immediately withdraw from the agreement. So when we didn't get the Trans-Pacific Partnership in place, um, just as an example, we know that the Australians have captured a tremendous amount of the market uh, in the Orient on the beef side. That's going to be a, a percentage of market volume uh, market demand that, that's going to take us a long time to get back, even if we can strike that unilateral or bilateral agreement. The numbers like what Mark uh, cited, they scare you? Yes, I think it's worrisome. The fact that, uh, uh, and I think it was yesterday, in fact, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that mentioned the TPP was signed by the other 11 nations. I just don't know where yeah. Mr. Trump comes off on this. And I, I have confidence that Sonny Perdue and a few people like Mark and those people in Washington are going to educate this man that, that uh, first of all, just like pork, for example, we, we're going to lose huge to a, to a, a tremendous uh, economy like Japan who's going to say, all right, we'll, 
buy our fresh and chilled pork from uh, Europe now because Europe uh, and Japan signed this deal. Europe's in on it too, and uh, they signed a, they signed a separate deal, I believe. But anyway, they're going to capture a lot of this pork demand, and we at this moment uh, supply Japan with more than half of their fresh and chilled pork, and that goes back. To not, it's not just pork; it's corn, you know, be, and and soybean meal. This is going to hurt corn and soybean farmers, you know, and 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 not only that, um, there has to be reciprocity. It's like Mark said, we have to give them something. We have to give them some access to our automobile markets, you know, and and create fair trade there. You know, they're saying that it's not fair trade if we have tariffs on their their auto parts coming into our our country. You know, so uh, reciprocity is important, and and the TPP was extremely unfortunate in my opinion. H, I'll, I'll also chime in here. I guess to me this is yet another validity of why crop insurance is, is Mark's membership's number one priority. So many things out of their control, such as weather, grain markets, grain markets now truly global as we're discussing yeah. mm -hmm. here. These trade agreements are out of farmers' control, obviously by and large, but they certainly impact their ability to capture grain prices or livestock prices. and So many risks out of their control is what that safety net is there to try to help them utilize. And for the audience, uh, Sonny Perdue was referenced by David. Sonny Perdue is the Secretary of Agriculture in the administration. And as a matter of fact, let's quickly, uh, if we can, Mark, talk just a little bit about the reorganization at USDA because he's the head of, of that and he's trying to get some reorganization. Is there a way, and I know there's a, a I don't want to get into a conversation, so the audience says, what's GYPSA and what's AMS and things like that, yeah. but could you give us an overview of what Mr. Purdue is trying to do? Well, I think um, the simple way to, to look at this reorganization is what Secretary Purdue is really trying to do is um, create a better efficiency, streamline the process, if you will, the agency, the bureaucracy that just inevitably exists uh, when you have uh, the United States government. There's a lot of bureaucracy. And so this is an attempt to um, make it a more efficient department and by by that I, I mean you know communication for example we've seen in the past where within the agencies uh, that exist within the, the USDA there is sometimes um, not the communication that needs to exist for them to implement the, the programs such as the farm bill or some of the other things that we've already talked about. So I think it's an attempt by Secretary Purdue to look at it and say just how can we make this a, a more efficient, more productive agency uh, within the federal government. And we certainly uh, applaud him for that. One of the frustrations that I know he has run into is just the time lag, not only in creating a different structure, but getting folks in the chair, uh, in those chairs with, with respect to heading up those various interagencies within that department. Um, for political reasons, in most cases, these have been delayed, and it's very unfortunate because you have a lot of good folks out there waiting to do their job or they're sort of uh, running in motion, if you will, or in place, um, kind of waiting for the boss to get there, and we need these chairs filled. We need these directors, these undersecretaries, these deputy directors to get appointed, and we, we've been pushing on that as well uh, through the political process. but. Um, I think that's really what he's looking at as he tries to create a, a better department, a more effective department. Let's turn the conversation to um, the, the 2018 Farm Bill. And let me start by saying that it was 1990 was the last time that a Farm Bill was agreed upon in Congress on time. Ever since then, we've lagged. Um, the 2018 Farm Bill, as we re referenced, uh, the 2014 Farm Bill expires in September. The 2018 will take over. What's the number one concern right now? Well, I think you've identified one of our concerns, and that is timeliness. Um, we very much want to see this Farm Bill get completed on time, and you've, you've referenced the fact that that has not occurred in recent years. Um, we do have, in my opinion, two very strong leaders uh, in Congress with respect to the House uh, Agricultural Committee and the Senate Agricultural Committee. The House Ag Committee is uh, chaired by Mr. Conaway. Uh, he is a Texas congressman. And the Senate is uh, chaired by Senator Pat Roberts from Kansas. Um, both of them are veterans. Um, both of them come with not only a lot of experience with respect to agriculture and some of the needs and the issues that we're trying to address in this bill, 
but they also have a very good understanding of the process that Congress needs to operate under. Um, Chairman Conaway in particular is an extremely efficient, organized uh, person when it comes to getting the committee focused, getting their work done. Um, the one thing I can say about the House Agricultural Committee, it is truly a bipartisan committee out there. It's probably one of the most effective bipartisan committees that I've observed in my time in working uh, on issues in Washington, D.C. So those are all positives. Um, the challenge with this bill is going to be the funding. And that's not a um, surprise in any way, but that's, that's going to be our challenge is how do we find balance uh, with the commodity title, the conservation title, the SNAP program or the nutritional program, which makes up the, the, the bulk of the cost of the bill. My understanding is that uh, Representative Conaway wants to, over time, reduce that amount uh, dedicated to SNAP and direct it to some other, what we would call, truly ag programs. That's correct. Um, I know that there is a, a very big focus uh, by Chairman Conaway, as, as well as other members of the committee, both in the House and the Senate, to look at that nutrition program and make sure that um, it's operating, again, in, a, in an efficient manner, that we're not overspending there. Uh, it's very important, and we, we discuss this a lot with our members. Um, I know that a lot of folks get frustrated as to why does that nutrition program need to be a part of the farm bill. Well, the way that that works um, in conjunction with the total bill is you now bring all of Congress, not just the rural folks that represent uh, individuals like David and our other farmers around the state, but you bring the, the urban congressmen and congresswomen in Miami and in Los Angeles and in New York and in all these urban settings who have tremendous needs. There are a lot of folks that have big needs when it comes to this nutrition program. Finding that balance, but making sure it's operating in a, in a um, uh, I guess you'd say, cost-effective manner is the focus. Doug, does the farm bill, how does that, with relation to farm prices, ag mm -hmm. prices, does it, is there a direct impact there? Absolutely. And I'm going to back up to crop insurance to explain one thing before I answer that. Crop insurance only allows us to protect that year's crop at the value of the crop of the year. So in other words, when grain prices are depressed like they are now, that lowers the value of the corn, that lowers the value of what we can cover. That's not enough now. As David indicated, he can't make money at today's prices. Farm Bill has some additional support for farmers to fill in the gap because crop insurance can't cover all the risk in that environment I described. So there was, there's additional safety net programs that farmers can address. And for example, this last farm bill, they had three choices. They had a one-time choice to choose three options on each of their farms. That choice lasted all five years of the farm bill. They couldn't change it. So the very important decisions that stick with the farm for the life of that farm bill and its additional support that our farmers have definitely needed. And we've seen it dwindle these last uh, five, first four years of this farm bill. The support payments have shrunk and gone away to a lot of counties in Illinois. And the regrettable part of that is we need the support now more than we did it, than we ever have because we're in our fourth year of decline of net farm income. So we are questioning, asking Congress to revisit th those supports in the last farm bill to at least take a look at do we need to change the formulas, do we need to somehow change the, improve that coverage because if we have the same three options in the next farm bill, the same calculations, it's not going to be anywhere near the support that we needed in this last farm bill. And, and of course, all that is dependent upon weather and trade. Absolutely. Correct. And but as you, but as Mark indicated earlier, it comes down to budget. What can what can we afford to spend on? The, and there's a lot of people asking for a lot of needs to be covered in a lot of different venues in this. The farm bill is the single largest piece of ag legislation. So there's a lot of a lot of um, people asking for their share in that process. Uh, in the final minute that we have, David, I want to have you talk a little bit about nutrient management because you're a no-till farmer. Are you using less nutrients, less herbicides, et cetera, on your farm now? Uh, no, but, um, and that, that's probably because, uh, first of all, using less nutrients uh, is counterproductive. Our yields are going up, so we're actually extracting more from the ground. So we're having to actually increase the use of fertilizer, but we're being more careful about how we place it. Okay, so uh, for example, strip tilling, I do that in the spring and I, I actually put a little less on than I would if I did it in the fall. But, uh, and there are other people that are uh, putting on nitrogen in a, in, a, in a different, in several different ways. So uh, I think that the evolution of uh, 
of the whole question of nutrient management is in cover crops probably to and you do cover crops starting starting to do cover crops management issue yep and that of course is dependent upon when the cover crop uh, reaches maturity in the spring can you plant your corn in time your beans in time etc so, yep. uh, with that we want to say thank you to Mark Gebhards Mark is the Illinois Farm Bureau Governmental Affairs Executive Director to Doug Yoder Doug is with Country Financial, where he's the crop agency manager. And let me say thank you to David Menel. David is a farmer with land in both Peoria and Stark counties. Thank you all for the conversation and the update on farm issues. We appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on that issue. Next time, we'll be taking a look at the arts. It's time to reflect on the meaning of arts and how it impacts your life. Join us for that conversation on the next Ad Issue.